This video is going to summarize the main languages, religions, and ethnic groups of the Middle East and briefly explain some of the minority ethnic groups. Where the Middle East exactly is and why it has that name could be its own video, but for the purposes of this video, the Middle East is a region at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa. It has no strict definition, but usually includes Egypt, Turkey, Iran, Syria, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and Kuwait. Afghanistan and Cyprus are sometimes included in the definition, but those countries could be their own videos. Technically, every country could be its own video, but since the ethnic groups often span multiple countries, this video will put them in a broader context. Ethnicity is a complicated concept for when groups of people identify with one another based on shared language, religion, and cultural traditions. The main religions of the Middle East are Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Islam is by far the most common religion in the Middle East, but most Muslims live outside the Middle East. Some of the countries where the majority of the population is Muslim are North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia. A significant number of Muslims live on the east coast of Africa, but they are only the majority in Somalia. Albania and Bosnia have slight Muslim majorities, with the Christian minorities and the irreligious making up just less than 50% of the population. Kosovo is a Muslim majority country which is not recognized by the United Nations, but it is recognized by many UN members. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and Indonesia are also Muslim majority countries. Due to these countries' high populations, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are first, second, and fourth in the world by total number of Muslims. The country with the third highest Muslim population is actually India, despite only about 14% of the population being Muslim. It's just that India's population of over 1.3 billion is so high that 14% is over 180 million. The country with the fifth highest number of Muslims is Nigeria, with a total population of 190 million, which is about 40% Muslim, mostly in the north, representing over 90 million people. In the Middle East, most of the countries are majority Muslim, but Israel is majority Jewish. As well, there are significant Christian minorities all over the Middle East. Most notably is Lebanon, where over 40% of the population is Christian. It gets even more complicated though. Islam is divided into two main groups, Sunni and Shia. The majority of Muslims worldwide are Sunni, but Shia Muslims are concentrated in the Middle East. It is common for Sunni and Shia Muslims to live in the same country. But in general, Iran, Azerbaijan, and the south of Iraq are Shia, while the north of Iraq is Sunni. Shia Muslims are also concentrated in the interior of Turkey and Afghanistan, and the coastal region of Syria and Lebanon. The people of the island of Bahrain and the nearby Saudi coast are Shia, but the royal family of Bahrain, and therefore the politically powerful class, is Sunni. Northern Yemen and neighboring parts of Saudi Arabia are Shia, while the rest of Yemen is Sunni. This divide, coupled with the fact that the North and South have only been unified since 1990, contributes to the tensions in the Yemeni civil war. The country of Oman has its own sect of Islam called Ibadism, which predates the Sunni-Shia split. Oman and Saudi Arabia use the Sunni-Shia divide to compete for influence in the Middle East, with Iran generally supporting Shias and Saudi Arabia generally supporting Sunnis. The religious divide is accompanied by a language divide, with Iran speaking Persian and the rest of the Middle East, except Israel and Turkey, speak Arabic. Overall, the most common languages in the Middle East are Arabic, Turkish, Persian, Kurdish, and Hebrew, which can be split into three language families of related languages. Persian and Kurdish are both in the Iranian branch of the Indo-European language family. This means they are closely related to each other and distantly related to some of the languages of Europe and India. Persian is the official language of Iran though many other languages are spoken, such as Kurdish, which is also spoken in parts of Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, but it is only an official language in Iraq along with Arabic. The official language of Turkey is Turkish, which is in the Turkic language family. Turkish is closely related to Azerbaijani and Turkmen, and more distantly related to the other languages in Central Asia. In Israel, the majority language is Hebrew, but both Hebrew and Arabic are official languages. Arabic and Hebrew are related Semitic languages which are part of the Afro-Asiatic language family. There are certainly minority languages all over, but Arabic is the official language of the rest of the countries of the Middle East. 
Except Arabic isn't really a single language. It's a bunch of regional dialects that are often barely understandable to one another. Arabic speakers will often know their own local dialect as well as modern standard Arabic that is used in writing and with speakers of other Arabic dialects. This is similar to the situation in China where there are many regional dialects all considered to be Chinese but the Mandarin dialect is used in formal contexts. The difference being that standard Arabic is not any region's local dialect while Mandarin is local to some parts of China. Most Arabic speakers are Arab but there are plenty of non-Arab ethnic groups which speak Arabic. Arabic originated in the Arabian Peninsula and many minority ethnic groups exist in the rest of the Arabic speaking world. In some cases, such as in the North African Maghreb, the local Berbers mixed with the Arabs, though the Berber language and identity still exist in some regions. In other areas, the local groups remain distinct and they live alongside Arabs and have adopted the Arabic language for convenience. For example, the Copts are a predominantly Christian ethnic group living in Egypt that represent about 10% of the population. In Lebanon, most of the Christians are in a group called the Maronites, though other Christian groups exist. The current president of Syria is an Alawite, which is a Muslim group that speaks Arabic and lives near the coast of Syria, but they are Shia in a country that is majority Sunni. This contributed to the tensions which led to the Syrian civil war. The main cause being that the president refused to step down following mass protests for democratic reform. The Druze are an ethno-religious group that lives in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel, and speak Arabic. They have their own distinct religion, which is similar to, but does not fit in with any of the main three religions of the region. Some minority languages also exist. The Assyrians are a predominantly Christian ethnic group in Iraq and Syria that speak a Semitic language called Aramaic. The Kurdish language is a minority in all the countries the Kurds inhabit, but Iraqi Kurdistan has recently gained high levels of autonomy due to the Iraq war. The Iraqi civil war was caused by the Syrian civil war spilling over into Iraq and stressing pre-existing tensions between the Sunni North and the Shia majority. The Kurds are a linguistic group and can belong to any religion, although the majority are Sunni Muslims. Some Kurdish speakers called Yazidis have their own religion which is similar to but distinct from the main religions of the region. They live primarily in Iraqi Kurdistan. The Kurds, Assyrians, and Yazidis are often the victims of mass killings and genocides, most recently carried out by Daesh in the Iraqi and Syrian civil wars. Daesh is also killing Shia Muslims. The third largest group in Iraq are the Iraqi Turkmen, who represent less than 10% of the population and speak a dialect of Turkish. In the Gulf states, there are many migrant workers from foreign countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the Philippines, who are not citizens and thus have limited rights, but can sometimes be the majority of the population. There are many more ethnic minorities in the Middle East, notably in Turkey, Israel, Palestine, and Iran, which again, would require their own videos to explain. But to summarize what has been covered in this video, most of the countries of the Middle East are majority Muslim, with the exception of Israel but most Muslims live outside the Middle East. The Arab League is an organization composed of Arabic-speaking countries and it includes all the countries of the Middle East except for Israel, Turkey, and Iran, but also includes the Arabic-speaking countries outside the Middle East in North Africa and the Comoros Islands.
Muslims would say that there is no division in Islam. There's just Islam and that's it. However, when it comes to organized religious differences, there are fundamental differences in the beliefs and practices of Sunni and Shiite, also known as Shia Muslims, that cannot be ignored. Welcome back guys to FTD Facts. My name is Leroy Kenton and in this episode we're going to be exploring the differences that has produced two groups who identify as Muslim, Sunni and Shia. So let's get into the differences starting right now. Starting at difference number 10 and that is the Prophet Muhammad's successor. This is considered to be the dominant difference between Shia and Sunni Muslims. In Shia Islam, they hold that Ali ibn Abu Talib is the appointed successor to the Islamic Prophet Muhammad, and he's the head of the Muslim community. However, Sunni Muslims hold on to the belief that Abu Bakr was actually the first Muslim leader after the Prophet Muhammad based on election. The difference at number nine is the difference in the afterlife philosophies. There's a whole lot to say about this, but uh, let's try to keep it as simple as possible. Both Sunnis and Shiites believe that in the afterlife, there's either paradise or hell. Now the split comes when deciding on how somebody actually gets to heaven or hell. For Shias, if one believes and follows the Prophet Muhammad as well as the 12 Imams, then paradise is guaranteed for them. However, Sunni Muslims believe that they must have faith in Allah, his prophets, believe in the righteous deeds presented in the entire Quran, as well as accept Muhammad as the final prophet in order to have a chance at attaining paradise. But even if you do all of the above, you're still dependent on the mercy of Allah. Let's talk about self-flagellation. This is a big one. So Sunnis disagree with the practice of self-flagellation so much that they view it as a sin, like a big sin. They do not even participate in the act in any capacity, in any way, shape, or form. Now over to the Shias, they practice self-flagellation to commemorate the martyrdom of Hussein. And these acts, they consist of flogging your own back, hitting your chest with your hands, or using knife or chains or other sharp objects. Now we're not going to show images because some of them get very, very, very graphic, but as you can imagine, this practice can be very, very painful for someone to experience. The difference at number seven is the worship at graves. Sunnis strongly oppose the idea of praying at grave sites and it's viewed as shirk or a major sin because they're relying on someone other than Allah for their help. Shias on the other hand they are totally fine with the practice and they actually encourage it. There are some varying beliefs about this though but touching or kissing the shrines of the prophets and the imams they believe that it does not imply shirk according to their beliefs nor does it associate that this particular person is equal with Allah because Allah has the ultimate sovereignty in this entire universe and Muslims submit to and worship and seek the help from him only. But she has maintained the idea that visiting shrines is merely a gesture of respect. They're not actually asking for help from those individuals who passed away. Now let's look at the difference at number six when it comes to choosing a leader. When it comes to choosing a leader, Shia and Sunni Muslims have completely different views. Shias believe that the doctrine of an Imam is perfect because it comes directly from God and that the leader of the Muslim community must be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Sunnis on the other hand don't believe that there is any basis in Islam to have spiritual leaders that are admired or being held in such a regard like this as a leader of a Muslim community. Also Sunnis believe that leadership shouldn't be a birthright but it should be a trust that is earned and which may be given or taken away by the people themselves through voting and election. All right guys, since you reached halfway in this episode, I just wanna take this time to let you know that we recently did a video about the 10 differences between Muslim and Christian prophets. So Islam and Christianity, they have a lot of the same prophets that are identified in each of their holy books. However, some of the details are a little bit different or some of the events are seen at different angles. So it's a very interesting one looking at the, the differences and the comparison and everything. So I'll link to it down below in the video description section. Enjoy that one after you finish watching this one. Okay, so let's jump back into this episode. Difference at number five. And this difference has to do with Al-Mahdi. Although the concept of Al-Mahdi is not an essential doctrine in Sunni Islam, 
it is popular among both Sunni and Shia Muslims. Both groups agree that he will rule over Muslims and establish justice. However, they differ when it comes to his attributes and his status. Sunni Muslims, generally speaking, do not believe that Mahdi has already been born. Sunnis in general reject the 12-er Shia principle. The Mahdi is the 12th and the last in a chain of the purified Imams. He was born on the 15th of Shaban, 255AH. His name is Muhammad and his titles are Mahdi among others and his birth was kept a complete secret. And she is believed that the 12th Imam Yasu will return as the Mahdi with a company of his chosen ones and his enemies will be led by the Dajjal or the false messiah. The next difference we're looking at at number four is temporary marriage. Temporary marriage is an ancient Islamic practice that usually happened when a man had to travel far distances. And pretty much what these marriages do is it unites a man and a woman as husband and wife, but only for a predetermined and temporary amount of time. Certain Shias still hold on to this practice. However, Sunnis, they view this as adultery. So if you're married and you leave without a divorce, that's adultery, that's a sin. The difference in number three leads us to holy cities. Both Sunnis and Shias have three common holy cities, which are Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. The only difference though is that Shias also believe that Najaf, Karbala, and Kufa are holy cities as well. Now, an important practice of Shia Islam is that of visiting the shrines of Imams in Iraq and also in Iran. In Iraq, these include the tomb of Imam Ali and also visiting the tomb of his son, Imam Hussein, because both are considered to be major Shia martyrs. The difference in number two has to deal with angels and their free will. Both Sunnis and Shias, they believe in angels, that God created them from light and they carry out his will, they're powerful creatures and everything. However, angels lead very different lives when it comes to <laughs> Shia and Sunnis. Okay, so for Shias, they believe that angels obey God's commandments, but they are granted the option to disobey. But with this belief though, Shias believe angels have no desire to sin, so they remain faithful regardless, but they do have the option to sin if they choose to. Sunnis though, they feel that angels always obey God's commandments, and that's because that they have no free will at all. So even the potential or the possibility to sin and stray from God isn't even there for angels. So as you can see, that would be a completely different lifestyle when it comes to the angelic beings based on the beliefs of Shia and Sunni Muslims. And finally, we end off with a difference at number one. And this is the difference in praying. Sunni Muslims, they pray five times a day. This is known by everybody, even people that aren't Muslim. Whereas Shia Muslims, they can combine prayers and pray three times a day. And uh, one of the things that you can use to identify a Shia praying is that you'll often see a small tablet of clay from a holy place, often from Karbala or a place like that. And on that thing, they place their forehead on it while they're bowing down in prayer. Now for Sunnis, Sunnis have their arms folded in various positions from below the navel to the chest, right over the left. But Shias keep their arms straight by their sides. And just like that, we've come to the end of another episode. This was a brief look at 10 of the biggest differences between Sunni and Shia Muslims. When you turn on the news, there's about a 50% chance that you'll most likely hear the words ISIS, Holy War, or Jihad. The term Jihad has almost become synonymous with the ideas of violence, hate, and in reality, everything it's not. The world needs to know the truth. That's where we come in. This is simple Islam. Taking Islamic concepts and explaining them before your coffee gets cold 
or before more youth are radicalized. For this episode, we are going to be talking about the true meaning of jihad. The word jihad is an Arabic word which simply means to struggle or to strive in the way of God. In Islam, there are two kinds of jihad which are termed the lesser jihad and the greater jihad. The lesser jihad is that struggle which is fighting in self-defense and in self-defense only against those who have harmed them and tried to deprive them from religion and God. At the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, the Muslims were persecuted for a long period of 13 years. They were stoned, whipped, tortured and boycotted in various ways but bore through this hardship with patience until God had finally allowed the Muslims to defend themselves against the violent crimes of the opposers. It was a temporary command for the Muslim people. What's interesting though is that when God allowed the Muslims to fight, it was only to create a peaceful society that would grant each religion liberty to practice and preach its own way of life. As we see in the Holy Quran, chapter 22, verse 41, And if Allah did not repel some men by means of others, there would surely have been destroyed cloisters and churches and synagogues and mosques wherein the name of God is oft commemorated. And God will surely help one who helps him. God is indeed powerful, mighty. Even when they had to fight, Muslims were under strict command of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him that they were never to be more unjust than the opposing army, were never to harm women and children and places of religious worship. When we study the history of Islam, we see that Muslims never attacked on the offensive but only in self-defense and in many cases demonstrated mercy and forgiveness on those who were unjust to their own civil liberties. Jihad is not a war to spread Islam, kill innocent people, and be involved in terrorist activities. The Holy Quran has very clearly stated in chapter 2 verse 257 that there is no compulsion in religion, which means that no one can be forced to become a Muslim or follow a religion. Faith is a matter of one's heart, and whichever faith takes one closer to God should be followed. Now the second jihad is the greater jihad. This greater jihad is the struggle against oneself to become closer to his or her God, be a law-abiding citizen, avoid evil inclination, and be the best possible Muslim one can be. The greatest jihad the Muslim faces is against himself and how he conducts himself. If he can be a just person when everyone around him is unjust, and be kind when everyone around him is cruel, then he is a true Muslim. This is what Islam and Jihad is about. It is sad and unfortunate to see that some Muslims are unaware of the true meaning of Jihad and create disorder in the world because they have been brainwashed to do so. Swords can win territories but not hearts. Force can bend heads but not minds. In the end, we as simple Islam realize that the world can be a harsh place and that the name of Islam and the concept of Jihad is improperly used by many misguided people. Every Muslim is called to wage Jihad. It says so in the Quran time and again. However, the true meaning of the word and verses have been a source of deep, sometimes bloody disagreement since they were written about 1400 years ago. In modern text, Jihad has typically been translated as to strive. Here's why. A journal paper in Asian Social Science explains, Linguistically, the word Jihad means effort or having effort. Somebody is suffering from an external or internal power, then he makes an effort to get rid of it or free himself from that misfortune. A few examples from the Quran. So obey not the rejectors of faith, but strive, Jihadum, against them by it, the Quran, with a great endeavor. And lo, those who believe and those who immigrate to escape persecution and strive jahadu in the way of Allah these have hope of Allah's mercy most religious communities have taken this to mean an inner struggle an ongoing personal spiritual battle to choose what is good and what is right when you hear that Islam is a religion of peace this is the reason this dominant interpretation calls for Muslims worldwide to wage the battle 
waged jihad against temptations and tribulations, leading to a fuller faith. As with many ancient texts, small groups have taken those verses and twisted them in a radical way with a literal meaning. In this case, radicals try to convince young, often troubled people that the only way of really waging jihad is to do it externally, violently. So when they read, therefore listen not to the unbelievers, but strive against them with the utmost strenuousness, they say it's a mandate to kill anyone who doesn't believe exactly like they do. A vast majority of Muslims and scholars today could not disagree more, pointing out only specific instances when violence is permissible. The Islamic Supreme Council of America lists these three exceptions. When there are aggressive designs to attack Islam, attempts to remove Muslims from legally acquired land, and when military campaigns are launched to eradicate Muslims. With more than 1.8 billion Muslims now around the world, making up a quarter of the planet and growing, there's a fierce effort to now reclaim jihad, the word, the sacred imperative that's been hijacked by radicals bent on death and destruction. Islam is based on five key practices known as pillars. The first is the profession of faith called Shahada. The phrase, there is no true God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, is at the heart of the religion. It must be understood and repeated aloud by anyone converting. The second pillar is prayer, which should be carried out five times daily while facing Mecca, at dawn, midday, mid-afternoon, sunset and evening. The third pillar is charity. Every Muslim, according to their means, is required to give part of their income to help those in need. The fourth pillar is fasting during Ramadan. Muslims over the age of puberty must abstain from food, drink and sexual intercourse from sunrise to sunset during the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. The purpose is spiritual purification, a gesture of compassion to those suffering hunger while simultaneously achieving spiritual growth. The fifth and final pillar is the pilgrimage to Mecca, the holiest site in Islam. Each Muslim is expected to make the journey once in a lifetime, provided they're physically and financially able to do so. Known as the Hajj, it takes place during the last month of the Muslim calendar. What's the most common misconception that Christians have about Muslims? Well, one of the common misconceptions is that every Muslim believes the same thing about Islam. They have the same beliefs. They have the same understanding of Islam. They, they're even, every Muslim is attracted to Islam for the same reasons. They consider themselves a Muslim for the same reasons. So that's a common misconception. The reality is just like Christians, that people believe different things about their faith. Another common misconception is this, that every Muslim holds their faith with the same sort of commitments and the same sort of tenacity that all the other Muslims do. There is a difference in, in, in Islam with Muslims about uh, who's really, really fervent in their faith and, and maybe is not as fervent in their faith, just like we see in the church here in, in the U.S. Another, I think, misconception, particularly when we think about here in the U.S., Muslims moving to North America, is that we believe that they move here, uh, they migrate here to be disruptive. The reality is they don't, most of them don't move here to be disruptive. Most of them move here because they're attracted to our way of life and they want to be a part of it. So what that means is there's an opportunity for us to be hospitable. They want to understand, they want to know how to thrive in our culture and in our communities. And so we have an opportunity to do that. And the final misconception of Christians with, uh, with Muslims is that uh, we don't share values with them. We, in fact, do share a lot of common values. Uh, we don't share a lot of common beliefs. There are some aspects of our faith that, that we share, some really basic aspects of the doctrine of God, but after that we kind of are very different. But we do share common values. We both love our families. We want our families to flourish. We want our kids to get an education. We want, our place, we want to live in safe places. Uh, we enjoy culture. There's all sorts of common values that we share and things that we can build on as we seek to build relationships with them.
Alhamdulillah. Why do Muslims always say that? So it means all praise be to the Lord. The way I say like, I say Alhamdulillah as well. It's a great word, you should use it as well, you know? It's a great word, it makes you feel good. We just say it like at the end of our sentences. Good or bad, all praise to the Creator. You seem like one of the nice ones. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> what is nice? You don't really know me. <laughs> if you're both Muslim, how can you speak another language? If you're both Muslim, who? <laughs> well, I'm from China. <laughs> Muslim is not a nationality or an ethnicity. It's a religion, so it's just something you choose. Anyone can be Muslim. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from. So and so is Muslim too. Do you know them? Probably. We're all in one big WhatsApp group, so every single Muslim in the world. Well, I don't know all the Muslims. Uh, if you just tell me which one you're looking for, I'm sure I'll find him. Maybe you should try reading the Bible, lol. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I did, actually. I've probably read more of the Bible than 90% of Christians I've met. Ashley read Bible. I've been to church. Uh, I've been to synagogue, I've been to temple. Um, there's a Bible in every single premiere in, so when I'm on tour, I actually bring it out and read it. I was never forced to do anything. My dad is like always like, you, you're going to find your own way, so I'm not going to force you, because if I force you, you don't really understand. Muslimic. Ray gun. Pew, pew. What's that? <laughs> Have you watched Mandalorian? It's a really good Star Wars series. It feels like it will fit. I need a translation. You've got Muslimic ray guns nowadays. What is... Estag... For a while. <laughs> I don't know, because you spilled it pretty rubbish. <laughs> <Just smell it>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know astaghfirullah means Allah forgive me, but I don't know about that one. Or if you see something that's a bit shady, you're like, oh, astaghfirullah. <laughs> <laughs>
I enjoyed uh, working with Americans. I was the only Pakistani uh, in that company. Uh, mainly about the U.S. is the the culture, the history. The history is very, very interesting. And I studied a little bit about the history of America, and uh, I translated some books about that, like especially Thanksgiving Day, the Independence Day. I've heard a lot about that. Very good people, American people, friendly people. They all love uh, American people, good people. So what do you like about American culture? American culture is good. Michael Jackson is very nice. He lived in America for about 15 years. My kids were born there. My brother lives there, he's a citizen. I have property in America. I am, what I'm sitting here is because of America. And Americans are the nicest people on the face of the planet. Unfortunately, they are governed by the worst politician on the face of the planet also. And your foreign policies are flawed. I won an international head of competition. I ended up going to LA and did a 40-day road trip around US, East Coast to West Coast. It was incredible. What was your favorite part? Oh my God, Antelope Canyon. <laughs> Arizona. I mean it. It was it was surreal. It was just absolutely incredible. So at the start of my trip, I could have a quarter of a burrito. Okay. By the end of the 40 days, I was having an entire burrito and a massive vanilla shake with it. It was in Insane. I'm from Kira, Pakistan. It's a uh, part of Punjab, about 150 kilometers northwest of Lahore. In 1976, my parents picked me up from here, Kira, took me to Lahore, put me into a Lahore American school. I went to Oberlin College for four years, did my bachelor's in economics. It was one of the most valuable experiences of my life. The friends I made are still my really good friends. They've come here, visited me here in Kira. Amazing people, amazing land. I traveled three times across from New York to San Francisco, down from Oberlin to Miami. I think one of the best things about the States um, is the fact that you can just about do everything within one country. You can uh, travel if you, if you can go skiing, you can do a desert safari, you can go to beaches, and then you go to Vegas. Okay. Oh, you like America? Yes, shirt. Yeah, this is sure. <laughs> do you like America? Yeah. yeah. You like? Yeah. I'm from the U.S. What do you like about America? Uh, we can't say anything about it because we should have, uh, we haven't visit that place. My brother lives in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And have, do you have a dream to go to the U.S. someday? Yeah, sure. Yeah. When do you hope to go? Uh, actually, it's it's been a hope from early childhood since my aunts moved there due to the Saddam regime. I like American people so much because they accept multicultural and they accept different... Do you have a plan to go there? Uh, actually, I planned two times, but both times uh, the American consulate here in Arbil, they rejected my uh, visa. I don't know why. Maybe they don't want me to see their culture. I'd like to go there, but if the American government, they don't want us to see there, it's okay. There's America just a country. We have almost 200 more countries. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Right. Take care. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I just want to let you guys know that none of those interviews were staged. Out of 14 people that I randomly interviewed, 12 of them had nice and uplifting things to say about the U.S. So it's important to understand that while Americans and many of the outside world is so intimidated by these countries, they are truly the most down-to-earth people, and they're just like you and me.